is Letitia James, the Attorney General of New York, sitting right there. You can There's see Donald, Donald Trump. Trump sitting there next to his attorney, Christopher Kais, his lead counsel. I think it's a real shame that we just got this late-breaking decision by the judge. There, there will not be cameras in the courtroom because that would serve as sort of um, a counter example to mm -hmm. some of these, you know, courtroom step presser events mm -hmm. that are that are taking place. Because certainly that's not going to happen inside the courtroom. There are things, you know, you, you can read a transcript. Um, you know, you can get reports from inside there and certainly CNN has you know a, a lot of people there but there are sort of ineffable things that you get just by observing a courtroom a glance a, a, you know the way somebody is seated it, whether or not you know we're hearing about sort of Tish James and uh, her eye contact right. with or you know not yeah. with Donald Trump th things like that that I think are are really important but um, no this is political theater you know the the um, press conference that that Trump just gave. I, I don't think we carried all of it because it was, you know, not really pertinent to actually the, the does case it at hand. The judge, if this continues, does that impact the judge and how? I mean, it, the, the facts are the facts, right? And what happens in the courtroom is clearly very different from what they see outside the courtroom. Yeah. But does this does it impact? Does it have bearing inside the courtroom if he's turning this into a campaign event? Um, no. It shouldn't. The answer is, is no. It, it absolutely should not. Um, and I think that this judge will do a good job of sort of keeping the court and um, the public opinion sort of separate. Mm -hmm. However, you know, we've been talking about this before. It, it could only impact the courtroom when it sort of veers off into that, tips over the balance of, you know, uh, potentially interfering with witnesses, um, when sort of danger comes into play, if he's actually, you know, advocating violence, for example, things like that. You know, we're seeing that aspect of it play out in some of his federal cases about, you know, where to, um, you know, really rein him in on his mm -hmm. First Amendment rights. Seen as Bryn Jingrass standing by for us once again. Bryn, the AG's office really just laid out what they hope the judge will do here. Yeah, it took a little less than an hour to do so. I want to go to what's happening right now, though, Kate, and then I'll talk about that. Right now, we're actually hearing from Trump's attorneys uh, and their side of opening statements, essentially saying here uh, that there were no attempts to defraud. There were no unjust profits made, and there are no victims in this case, essentially saying Donald Trump built a huge empire, and he did it all, you know, what? rightly so, uh, essentially saying that he didn't do anything that was against any rules and he performed all the right uh, sort of maneuvers in order to make money. And so we're this is the crux of their case, right? This is how they are trying to defend their clients. We know that Donald Trump is sitting there at that table with his attorneys weighing in on what they're saying as they're giving these opening statements. But prior to that, you're right. We heard about, like I said, an hour or so less than uh, from the state's attorneys uh, saying that they did defraud that they they uh, wrote out financial statements and lied on those financial statements. We saw video depositions from multiple members of the Trump family, including the former president, his adult sons, and members of Trump organization, including uh, the former CFO, Alan Weisselberg, and the state's attorneys asking the questions of when they were lying. Were they lying then or are they lying now? So these are some of the things uh, that we are hearing from inside that courtroom as these opening statements uh, continue. And... Sorry, I'm just getting some information from my from my producer here is saying uh, that Trump actually is standing and he's leaving in the middle of these opening statements uh, that are happening and there is a 10 minute break. So he's actually leaving that courtroom. So I'm not sure if we'll actually get uh, my colleague down here to give some more information. Kara Scannell, she's inside the courtroom. But uh, again, just a 10 minute break during those opening statements. So we're still trying to get that information. But guys, the crux of this case obviously laid out in these opening statements, a lot of uh, questions as to what uh, if there was any fraud, we know that the judge made a huge ruling last week uh, saying that there was fraud in some of elements of this case and penalizing Trump and his sons and the Trump organization, taking away some of the business certifications as well. And we'll see if he hands down huge penalties in the amount of dollars. Uh, that's one thing that the state's attorneys uh, did say before they wrapped up their side of the thing, saying that they don't they want they asked the judge to bar the Trump family from doing business in the state of New York. So again, things are very fluid right now. Of course, we're going to continue to get you updates from inside that courtroom, uh, but a lot being laid out about how this case is going to look, and we're hearing it could last as long as three months, and we do fully expect, guys, Trump to take the stand at some point.
Yeah, and while you're speaking, and we're looking at one of the live cameras from outside the courtroom, Bren, and we do see, as, as you've been, as you just reported, looks like they have started a break as we're seeing people leaving court, and it does look almost like they're setting up for the for Donald Trump himself to be walking out soon as well. We're going to keep our eye on this, Bryn. One thing that I'm seeing from our colleagues in the courtroom also reporting that for the attorney general's office in their opening statement they asked the judge to bar donald trump from doing business in new york that's one of that's on top of financial penalties that they're already have clearly already sought that would be such a blow to donald trump the business the organization the empire and the brand yeah, so no, that is, that's one of the things that we also don't know what's going to happen next after the judge's ruling last week. As I said, the business certifications from Trump, his sons, and the Trump organization uh, were stripped. And it's the last week during a hearing, the judge gave Trump's attorneys another 30 days to figure out exactly what that would look like. So that's very unclear where that stands right now. But yes, just before they finished those opening statements, they said that they do want to bar the Trump from doing business in New York, and this is where his empire, uh, you know, started. So it's very unclear as to what the future of the Trump organization and the wealth of the Trumps will look like after this trial uh, gets finished. Remember, it's a very significant trial, and like you said, the. Um, the attorney general is asking for $250 million, which doesn't seem much to the Trumps, but the judge is the one who makes the discretion of how much he's going to penalize for finding uh, whichever way he chooses on these uh, issues at hand in this trial. So it's going to be significant, and it's so interesting as we watch uh, the beginning of this, before opening statements even started, about how Trump made all these comments uh, attacking James, as he hasn't been shy about doing, attacking the judge, which, again, he hasn't been shy about doing. Doing, not even addressing Letitia James when he walked into the courtroom today. Uh, and, you know, the judge is the one who's going to make those decisions, not a jury. So uh, we're going to certainly see how that all lays out. Another thing, uh, when we talk about him testifying, we also could hear from his sons as well. Uh, his attorneys saying that they're going to be bringing people to the stand that are going to show uh, that the way he did, they, they filled out all these financial statements, that they are just everyday things that happen in the state of New York, that they were completely okay and there was nothing wrong about them. So it's going to be a lot of interesting testimony, although it's very confusing, right, because it has to do with all these financial statements. But at the heart of the case here is, did they commit fraud? Did they knowingly commit fraud? The judge making that huge ruling last week saying that they did. So we'll see how it continues to play out. Absolutely. Bryn, thank you. Bringing us details from inside court as we continue to look. Now that they're in break, um, expecting that Donald Trump will be leaving the courtroom sometime soon, uh, Caroline and Ellie are, are here with us once again. What we heard from Trump's, uh, Trump's attorney as Bryn was laying out, no victims, there was no intent to defraud, there was no unjust profits, and there were no victims. Yeah. That is a valid defense to the remaining counts. Again, important to note, the judge has already ruled in favor of Donald Trump before the trial on one of the counts, but these are the remaining counts. That is a valid defense. I want to hear what the AG's response to that is going to be. Another really important thing, the fact that this is not a jury trial changes everything. It changes everything about the public statements. It changes mm -hmm. everything about mm -hmm. the way you would give your opening statement in the court, it changes everything about what witnesses you're going to call, how you're going to cross-examine them, because now you're making your case not to, in this case, six civilians, but to not just a judge, but a judge who knows this case. He's probably the foremost expert on this case. So that really changes the entire atmosphere here. And we saw how brief the yeah, opening statements short. were compared yeah. to what we're used to here. And that may speak to what Ellie's talking about. Yeah, the judge doesn't have to get up to speed on anything. You know, to, you, to your point, Kate, this first sort of landmark decision in the summary judgment that the judge ruled on last week, um, it's, it's kind of a unique uh, statute in that the pervasive fraud, typically in fraud charges, the hallmark of a fraud charge would be some sort of intent to defraud, would be a, a, a victim. Um, this is more of a what we call sort of a strict liability charge in that really the judge was able just to look at the facts. He's already the, you know, is going to be ruling on the law, but for this bench trial, he's also the finder of fact. He looked at the, um, you know, the receipts, as it were, and said, no, this is, this is fraud. Um, as a matter of law and as a matter of fact, this is 
fraud and we don't need to move forward with that count. Now, for the you know issue of intent on these other issues, I think you know there are five individual defendants here on top of all of the the, the entities. Um, you know, I, I don't anticipate it, but we definitely could see sort of a blame game going on, a sort of a finger pointing, specifically maybe with Alan Weisselberg. I, I expect there to be some.